Thank you, Josh, and thank you to all who've uh, brought us together to talk about why, uh, why things fail and how things fail and what we can do about it in an in interconnected world. So what I'm going to talk about is power grids. Power grids are really fundamental to our urban society. Without power systems, we really could not have the urban, uh, the, the design, even the population that we currently have today. So just looking at the world from a night, you can see that electricity has fundamentally changed the way that the world works. Uh, because of electricity, we can have cities that have tens of millions of people, and you can move from one place to another through subways or roads with traffic lights without, uh, without too much delay. Sometimes a delay, but without, you can actually move in uh, spaces with millions and millions of people. Because of electricity, rural farmers are now able to look up prices on their cell phones and, uh, and understand how to get their, their, pri their products to market. Because of electricity, we are instantly connected to almost anyone in the world. I can Skype in video with a uh, student in India in seconds. Uh, electric power grids have really changed and enabled uh, the complex interconnected world that we have today. However, electricity grids, electric power grids fail in really spectacular, dramatic, and troubling ways. Uh, in August 2003, we had a few power lines that were connected, um, that were where a utility had been negligent in their tree trimming. The power lines had been sagging into those trees, uh, and this was happening in Ohio, and, uh, and those lines failed. After those lines failed, that caused other things to fail, that caused other things to fail. Generators, power lines, uh, and other pieces of the power grid were failing in sequence, and pretty soon 50 million people in North America had gone without power. A uh, similar sequence of events just last year, September 2011, um, an, uh, a grid operator, or an actually a maintenance person, had been given the task of making a fairly routine switching event. He had a checklist. He went through one, two, three, four, five, six, forgot to do number seven, went to eight, and the moment he did number eight, it caused a, uh, a, a very large power line to fail, and that triggered a sequence of events that uh, left five million people without power. Similar event happened in Europe in, in uh, uh, the year before, or in 2006, in which the uh, operators opened a line over uh, the Ems River, and 15 million Europeans lost power. And then just uh, this July, we had two events on two days in which a power line that had some er uh, errors in its re relay settings, um, and at the same time, people in India, particular utilities, consuming more than their allotted amount of power, led to, on the 31st of July, about 10% of the world's population losing power in the matter of minutes. And so how is it that we ended up with this electricity infrastructure that most of the time serves us very, very well. Uh, most of the time when I stick something in the wall socket, um, my, my stuff works, which is fabulous. But sometimes it fails in these really spectacular ways. So I think to, know, to understand this, it's useful to kind of go back in history a little bit. In 1882, uh, Thomas Edison had been invented a system for generating, and, and not really Thomas Edison and his entire lab team has invented a system of generating DC electricity. DC is direct current, so the power only goes one way. Um, and, he, and he set up a station so he could sell this invention to wealthy homeowners in New York City. So he set up a station. It was called Pearl Street Station. About 82 homes uh, in, in, uh, in New York City signed up to, uh, with about 200 light bulbs, put them in their homes, and they were able to be fed by this uh, really fascinating station. However, this problem, this, this method of distributing electricity wasn't scalable. Um, DC electricity at low voltages, like in Edison's design, couldn't really go very far before it's all gone. So we needed a better system. Ta enter uh, uh, Tesla. So uh, Nikolai Tesla was a, a fabulous inventor, had more uh, amazing inventions than, than we'll probably ever know about, because he wasn't very good at publishing them at times. Uh, but he, one of the greatest inventions was the whole system of distributing, uh, of generating and transmitting uh, AC electricity. So Tesla figured out if that we could uh, make our generators, our motors, and our, um, our transmission lines work with alternating electricity, electricity that goes back and forth rather than direct. Uh, we could move things at much greater efficiency 
and, on, and have much rel more reliable power. So the Edison or Tesla's design uh, went into the Niagara Falls power station, delivered power to streetcars and factories in Buffalo, and really enabled the Industrial Revolution in the United States. So here we go. We've got Niagara Falls uh, sending power to Buffalo, New York. Pretty soon, Pittsburgh, the center uh, where I went to graduate school in Pittsburgh, uh, one of the centers of the metals industry. So Pittsburgh was connected. And that was a really great system. And pretty soon, we had connected other cities in the Northeast to this really simple power grid. But what's interesting is the structure of this grid. As soon as lightning comes, um, the immediately when that lightning hits, it causes pieces of the grid to fail. And immediately, uh, well, initially, we had very little protection systems. And so, uh, so pieces of equipment, very expensive pieces of equipment, would fail instantly. So we invented circuit breakers, circuit breakers that could interrupt the current flow of current when that lightning came along, which is really great. But as soon as that happens, uh, and we interrupt the flow of current, all the factories in Pittsburgh are dead. They've now lost millions of dollars worth of steel that's frozen into, the, into their system. So what we did, decided is that we could interconnect our systems. We can take, uh, make it so that if that line between Buffalo and Pittsburgh fails, we can get power from other places. And we've created, instead of having a tree network, we've gone to a mesh network. Very different network structure. Um, that has very different properties. And one of the most important properties of mesh networks is that they're very susceptible to cascading failures. So uh, now I'd like to introduce you to a friend, and this, is, this friend is uh, the Polish power grid. This is a, a data set that, um, that's available for the Polish grid. I'm not sure why they, they released it to the world. But it's really interesting because you can actually do all sorts of interesting things with this. So this is a, I'm going to show you a simulation of the Polish power grid. And one of the interesting, important things about power grids is that they're designed so that no single thing typically will cause a big blackout. Um, but sometimes, if we're unlucky enough and things f fail in combination, they cause really big blackouts. And so in this graph, what you see is that the green lines uh, are, are showing where the transmission lines are, and they're shown in proportion to their flow, and so fatter lines are, are, are have more flow on them. All the dots are cities or generators, particular places where... Ge uh, power is created or consumed. And, uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to cause two, the two little black lines to fail in the middle, and then simulate what happens uh, as we go forward. So here we go. There's two lines failed. All those black line failures are subsequent components that failed because the power lines overloaded as a result of the first failures. And those uh, overloaded power lines fail, causing other power lines to be overloaded causing those fail power lines to fail. And pretty soon, we're pushing enormous amounts of power up into that northern region, and the two grids separate. Now you've got two separate power grids, one of them continuing to uh, experience extreme stress and failing. And now you're seeing those really heavy red lines, really heavily overloaded power lines. And eventually, the whole system separates into, uh, into six different power grids most of which are not serving very much of their load at all. And so by, uh, by using computers and simulation, we can understand what happens when you break these systems in a way that we couldn't before. Um, one of the things that we come to understand is that power grids are very different than dominoes. So dominoes are the, are the signature little uh, uh, picture for our, our event, big scale, big fail here. Power grids are really different than dominoes. If you'd notice in that simulation, the, the next transmission line to fail was not necessarily the one that was right next to it. It could be hundreds of miles away. And this is something that we see over and over in the United States. But the next thing to fail is probably not the one that's most closely connected to it. So in a system that's at this complicated, is there really any hope for understanding it? Uh, one thing I would like to do is to figure out how can we... Um, so what I'm going to do is, is talk about three quick methods uh, that we're looking at to try to come up to, to reduce the risk of big blackouts and power grids. The first thing we'd like to do is use lots of new sensors that are being deployed in the grid to try to predict big blackouts before they happen. And so here I've got a time series of voltage. This is a sort of time series that hundreds of operators every day look at every single day. And if you look at the time series, nothing interesting has happened. Um, unfortunately, this is right uh, be, the moment after I just showed you, uh, the whole system falls apart and you reach a point of instability. Um, and so we would like to be able to uh, predict those instabilities before they happen. 
Now, you can't really see it from the time series alone, but one thing that you can do is zoom into it and look at the properties of the noise of the time series. We've actually developed this method in, uh, inspired by stuff that's been applied to um, predicting epilepsy in people who are epileptic, uh, predicting climate change from large climate change models. The same trends show up in power grids. Uh, if you look at the variance of the signal, it increases dramatically before things, uh, b b things fall apart. It also, if you look at the correlation across time within the signal, that's a really good predictor of how far you are from a, from a blackout. Again, another thing that we've been working on, and this is a collaborative work with uh, Professor Maggie Epstein here at UVM, uh, trying to figure out how can we find the weak links in the system, not by looking at things that fail alone, because when things fail alone, that doesn't cause big blackout but looking really strategically using a very carefully designed algorithm uh, to figure out how can we find pieces that fail in combination and then look at the properties of that. So one of the things what I'm showing you here in this graph is that there are some transmission lines that fail many, many times more frequently than others when in combination. And so now we, because we're able to look uh, at large data sets with good simulators, we can actually find the pieces that are most vulnerable to large blackouts. And probably most important of all, of all is, that, uh, is that the way that people respond to blackouts is very different from one case to another. In 1977, New York City experienced a, uh, a debilitating blackout. Um, and because of the social conditions at that time, and because there were very little black backup and the emergency prepared preparedness systems were not particularly ready for a blackout, um, People, uh, New York City experienced major looting and rioting as a result. 3,000 people were arrested. Um, the same events in 2003 actually were fairly benign. So here are people sitting in the, uh, in, in the steps of the New York Library. It was actually, people described it as a party scene. And so how do we create our societies so that the basic infrastructure can maintain itself, can continue even if the power grid fails? Because sometimes it always will fail. So if we can do these things, I think we can make our society much less uh, susceptible to very large blackouts.